welcome back to an earful podcast with me, Matty, and my two other co-hosts, Matt and Matt. Matt, refreshing. Yeah. The triple threat. Anyway, uh, on this episode, <laughs> we have Chris Dudley of Under Oath. Yeah, we had a, a great chat all about Under Oath, the latest record, writing processes, uh, horror, a big chunk of horror. It was nice to actually have a you know yeah, a, a guest who in a while is a fan of horror. My, you're a dick. Um, <laughs> did you hear Dodger? I did. Yeah, we'll edit that out. Um, yeah, and we also got to talk about scoring and compositional work, which is really exciting. Uh, for one, there is some boring gear chat, but, you know. We all love to see it. Exactly. And if I you mean... do love to see it, you can also find all of our previous episodes on YouTube and all podcasting platforms at an Airful Podcast. And if you want to find us on socials, you can do by, again, going to at an Airful Podcast. And if you don't already know, we now have a Patreon where you can get additional content. If it's not from uh, 2000 Trees, where we've asked all the guests that we spoke to a bonus question that you have to go there to find out about. And we also have our merch with our T-shirts and hoodies, long sleeves. So go and check them out. Um, What's the link for Patreon again? (laughs) Is it www.patreon.com forward slash an earful pod? A, a podcast nearly nearly got it i mean it is very easy it's all linked below right hello welcome back to the podcast and we are joined by chris dudley from under Oath. how's it going uh it's going awesome thanks for uh thanks for having me i'm yeah glad to be able to uh nerd out about some uh some horror stuff and some music oh, stuff it's yeah, yeah it, it was it was an easy sell for me to get me on here <laughs> just t- tell me i get to just talk about music and horror for however long so yeah all, all good it's like the yeah. dream pitch to some people and <laughs> yeah yeah it's it's funny because it's like it's like oh man well you know how how big is the podcast it's like i don't know it's just they're they want to talk to me about music and horror movies so i'm i'm freaking sold in. on that <laughs> yeah. well, as soon as i saw your mask collection i was like oh that's perfect okay yeah yeah, yeah man i yeah i've got a thing with for with masks um yeah you know if, if i if i score a film that has a mask in it i always try to, to get it from the from the director um oh, yeah, but i just nice. yeah there's a, there's a couple artists that i um you know that i follow and you know if they're you know coming out with something cool i'll i'll try to get it i have a actually a mason verger mask on the way uh from the guy who did this one here on the uh, hip up here on the end that like the like nice skin one he is doing a mason verger one uh and it oh man it looks looks bananas yeah I i'm uh it. i'm the same with you with masks i've got my own little oh there we go and oh that's awesome scream sort of collection going on and yeah nice yeah mate so i appreciate the mask collection you've there, got we going on. there we go there we go actually the guy uh that is doing my mason verger he did a couple of these other ones and he he's he did a really really good uh halloween kills uh replica oh, um, nice. i'll, I'll yeah. send you his info if you uh if you want to see it's yeah it's really good yeah man <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <an easy sell. laughs> yeah <laughs> I spent too much money on them, like, honestly. <laughs> Every time he gets a new one, it's just like, mate, how much do you spend on that? It's just like, you don't want to know. Just let's not talk about that now. <laughs> well, what's good is uh, two of the artists that I love, they happen to like my band as well. So I'll come into town and they'll be like, hey, like, I'll bring you a mask if you get me some some good tickets. And I'm like, nice. duh, easy. So, yeah, it, it works out great for me. Love it. I was going to say, you've got like two of the worst uh, outgoings there, Chris. Masks and then synths as well. Yeah, Which yeah. What's both... good with the synths, though, is that it's it's like all quote unquote work. Um, yeah, so true. if I'm <laughs> if I'm buying a synth, it's like, oh, uh, babe, it's, it's for work. I, you know, I've, I've, I've <laughs> got to, um, you know, but I've been trying to do better with that stuff, um, you know, you know, buying software but also buying synths in that i you know i was going to go down like the the modular euro rack route but i just really didn't that's just a money suck once you get into that like you just it's yeah. never ending buying things so i um i uh, ended up getting the the poly brute which i love and it does 
so much that I don't feel a need to go out and buy a bunch of other stuff. Even though I'm getting little fun things here and there, I'm not like, I don't feel like there's any big holes in my, uh, my, my toolkit, if you will. So yeah. Yeah. It like covers such a broad range. Like everyone sings praises about the, uh, the poly brute. Yeah. Is that the monologue you have there? Uh, the prologue. The prologue. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. yeah that thing, Which that thing rolls. First. Yeah, yeah no, places. I love it. And then is that a drum, uh, machine the mo the, uh, one in the back so par monocon yeah oh yeah okay yeah yeah Which well, i didn't even get for music it was just like oh let's twist things and see what happens that's, it's very that's sick though into modular as i'm going yeah no it's very sick though i want to get one of those i just can't justify it to myself right now people who don't care about synths are they've already turned this off though <laughs> yeah. we, had, we had a bit of masks in yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know. we'll drink but, uh, feed it in <laughs> yeah well let's 180 it then um one thing that's always interested me about Under Oath is, and it's like your approach for it is, that's, well, that's basically my question. How do you approach it? Because, you know, synths, you can cover all the frequencies and leave no space for the band at all. So how's the, the writing process, especially for the latest album, been? Well, it, it really varies song by song, um, you know, cause like you said, there's only, you know, so much sonic space and, um, you know, particularly when you have multiple guitars and bass and loud vocals and loud drums, you know, trying to figure out where, you know, everything sits is, is key. And I, you know, when you mentioned our, our new record, like, I, I think that we've, we've found a really good, uh, a really good balance in that, you know, we're not trying to like, you know, shove, you know, 10 pounds of meat in a five pound bag. It's like, we recognize, Hey, like there's not room here for, you know, a big guitar lead thing. And then like a, you know, a, a big synth whale thing, you know, we have to figure out what's going to go where and what's good is me and Tim both are very, very willing to give up our like quote unquote our spot in a song for the other, you know, where they're, you know, I'll be coming up with something and, and then I'm just like, you know, I, I feel like this is a guitar part, you know, like see if you can figure out something. And there'll be other times where, you know, he's trying to figure out stuff on guitar and he's just like, this isn't a guitar thing at all. He's like, you know, you make this, you know, some sort of electronic thing. And, um, you know, in some songs start, as, uh, you know, electronic ideas, you know, things that, things that come from me, um, you know, some songs start with guitar, some songs start with drums. So it's really a song by song thing, you know, some, uh, some take a little more work than others. Some just like flow out, you know, just, just depends. Yeah. But you're naturally hearing that like, oh, let's not force it. Cause otherwise the mix is just gonna. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, yeah. Particularly forced. with a, a lot of the bigger stuff, um, you know, uh, you know, cause if you have like a, just a big, like open guitar thing and you want it to be like big and wide and loud, you know, you, you, you have to be mindful of whatever you're doing there electronically because it'll just start to sound like mud if you're not careful. So, you know, a lot of the stuff that we have where you think like, Oh man, it's just sounds so big and low and heavy. If you really, if you broke down the mix, there's only like maybe one thing that's actually hitting this like low section and everything else. If you sold it out, sounds really weak um, on yeah. its own. But then when you put it all together, that's what like, you know, that's what makes it sound the way it does. So, um, you know, it's we've been doing this a long time and it's a lot of trial and error. But, you know, I, I think we're we're starting to get it. So I think that's the interesting thing when it comes to the composition side, like where you can literally transcend something that you originally played on a synth to then take it to a guitar and then mm -hmm. you have a completely different aspect on it. Yeah. And you could either like enhance the song or you could change it completely. I think like it's an interesting aspect in terms of songwriting where, where it's just literally like it could give you like a completely new perspective on a song that you never had before. Yes. Yeah. And, and that's something that we're very aware of. And, you know, just because with, uh, you know, electronics in general, like I could make, you know, you could just have like a three note part, but depending on what you're choosing to play it on, it will make it sound like a completely different thing. It could be, you know, some high wispy, like ambient thing, or it could be some growling, uh, you know, just monster part, but it just, it just depends on what, you know, what 
instrument you choose to use, what plugins you decide to use. And that's where a lot of my time is spent. And honestly, I, I try to have that time not be around the other guys because I don't want them to have to sit there while I'm like <laughs> trudging away at plugins <laughs> and EQs and all this stuff. Like I like to come, you know, ready to roll. And, you know, so when they're like, oh, like that part's cool. Let's just like make it sound different. I'm like, okay, well, we'll do that later. I'll make a note of it. I'll, I'll go home in my sound dungeon and sit for hours, you know, messing around with sound. So yeah, but that's, that's one of the fun parts too, I think. That's the thing. <laughs> I was I'm literally just thinking of that concept of going, oh, can we change that slide? You go, yeah, sure. And it's like five hours later. <laughs> yes, exactly. But I think that if you know, that that's coming. If you know, like, Hey, you're asking me to ch just, you know, change this little thing, but you don't recognize like how much needs to go into that, you know, wh whatever kind of artist you are, you know, if you're a, you know, if you're a, a, a painter or an architect or whatever, it's like, it's like asking an architect, like, Hey, this is great. Like, you know, we just want the basement to be like 10 square feet bigger and then we're good. <laughs> and it's like, okay, well that's going to take a lot. Like, so let me get back to you. So yeah, I, th I think it's just, uh, you know, it's just, uh, it's not real problems though. It's just, uh, you know, keep, keeping, keeping a correct perspective on it. I think. I think that's smart though, because you know, everything sounds so polished when you're writing together, like you get everything up to a certain standard that, you know, like you say, changing one item, you, you could be looking for the sound for, you know, if you don't know what it is and you're just waiting for that one thing to jump out at you. Yes. Yeah. And, and sometimes that takes other people too, you know, like sometimes that takes, you know, one of the other guys saying like, Oh, that thing there, like, what was that? And, uh, you know, <laughs> me being able to say like, Hey, like this isn't necessarily my favorite sound that I have, but if everybody else is digging it, then great. Or vice versa, you know, with guitar stuff or vocal stuff, like, you know, there'll be times when, you know, one of us will be like, Ooh, that vocal thing, like, that's what you should do. And like, you know, Aaron or Spencer are like, yeah, I'm not sure if I'm totally feeling it, but if we're all like freaking out, then it's like, okay, well, that's, what's best for the song then. So. So, um, obviously apart from doing uh, the band stuff, you've, you, you compose for horror films, uh, as well, uh, which we'll like get into a bit more later. Um, where do your influences come from when it comes to like obviously getting your synth parts in from the band and then like and then also obviously doing your like your compositions as well for, and your scores for films because obviously I know there's there's got to be some sort of like probably difference between them both you know when you're doing your score and then compared to when you're doing your music but I can hear those sort of horror influences in some of your tracks for example you, Pneumonia off the new album halfway through that there's a really cool synth bit in there that does give me Halloween three vibes and it's, yeah, it's, it's ace. Yeah. Like where, where do, where do influences come from in that sort of aspect? Um, you know, when it comes to the film stuff, uh, you know, I, I've always been attracted to artists that use electronics in a, in a, in an odd way. Like, you know, like I've, I've always loved basically everything Tom York does. I love, um, you know, I love, uh, you know, the stuff that Imogene Heap does. Um, you know, I, you know, I love Dep Depeche Mode, you know, th that doesn't necessarily go so far into, uh, the scoring world, but, yeah. you know, uh, Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross, um, you know, everything they do, I think is, is awesome. And, you know, in general for uh, Colin Stetson, you know, he doesn't really use electronics that mm -hmm. much, but I, he's just, amazing um but i think that my influences tend to come from from you know composers and musicians that just kind of they take a, they'll take a piece of music but then they'll kind of tilt it a little bit you know there'll be something that's a little detuned or something that's a little out of out of uh out of time um you know and i just love listening to music in general whether it's film music or not that like makes me like sit back and like just say whoa like this is amazing. You know, like Godspeed, you black emperor, I think is, is a great example of that. Um, this, uh, what's, uh, there's a, this artist named Val, um, that, uh, I, I met semi recently and we, you know, connected really well. And he, he just scored a film called a wounded fawn, which is, um, a really good film. And he let me hear some stuff that he's working on and that's been inspiring me a lot lately. Um, yeah, so it comes all over the place, but right now I'm in the middle of, uh, working on this. Um, it's like a, 
it's not a horror movie. It's like a kids, uh, like a, like a PG superhero movie. So I'm, uh, you know, taking all these other influences from like, you know, different, you know, yeah. different pop artists, you know, stuff that, you know, Lud- Ludwig Gorenson does. Um, you know, I love, I love, uh, composers and musicians who are able to like, you know, tread that line between like band artist production and film composition, you know, cause that there's, there's some overlap in the skill set there, but there's also, a lot that you have to know for one that you don't the other. So, yeah, uh, that was yeah. definitely the thing with um, Ludwig's uh, score for Tenet because there was the, it was weird like hearing that aspect of like it being like, within like a Chris Nolan film, but mm-hmm. yeah, he was also the same guy that works with Charles Gambino, so that you could hear both of them yeah. kind of like battling with each other throughout like the score throughout the film. Yeah, that guy's a monster. He's just oh my gosh, he's he's so good. Like I, I'll never forget the first time I saw Tenet. Um, you know, I wasn't particularly paying attention to the score, but you know, I'm always I'm always listening. And there's this thing, there's a track called Freeport, and it's uh, it's that like uh, you know, kind of like that that sequence that kind of has like a, uh, the, the rhythm is kind of like Meshuga ish and it's like a modular synth, uh, sequence. And when that was happening in the theater, I remember I literally put my hands on my head and I was just like, what is happening? Like it was just <laughs> so cool. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I live for that stuff. So with that in mind then, how does it, work just jumping back to under oath um how does that work <laughs> into in terms of like the writing process with those guys because do you bring stuff to them to start off with as like as a ground basis for a track or is it very much like the ground basis will be built of the song my dog's just decided to jump in on the chat oh, um, <laughs> and then uh, kind of go from there with it um it really depends on the song it kind of goes back to what i was saying before you know there are some songs that you know are my ideas and then you know we write on top of those and vice versa you know sometimes you know Aaron or Spencer will come in with like a a halfway done song and then you know I'll get I'll bring it into my studio and and start working on it and doing stuff um so yeah it just depends on the song we don't really have a uh a formula um you know, because I, I think that we are, we're always kind of trying to achieve different things with different songs. You know, if we were writing this a similar song all the time and just wanting to recreate that, I think that's where a formula would come in. But we always just kind of go into the writing process kind of like shrugging and we're just like, what's exciting us right now? You know, and then, yeah. you know, we'll we'll start a drop box with, you know, where we'll put everybody's stuff that they're working on on their own. And then like, you know, Aaron will hear something that I did. He's like, Oh, that like, we should do something like that. Or I'll hear something that, you know, Tim did. And I'm like, Oh, let's like, I have an idea for that. So it's, you know, it's just kind of a, it's a fluid process, but I think that that's kind of what makes it exciting or I keeps like it that. exciting. I don't, you know? we've, I don't think we've seen many, like the bands we've spoke to in the past have never said like, Oh, we share a Dropbox folder and I'll check it in. Like, I know for ourselves, when we've written music together, it's let's wait till we get to the room. But I like that idea of all these ideas in a folder. Yeah. And the reason that works out well for us is because, um, you know, we don't live, we don't all live near each other. So when we all get together, it's like, uh, it's a very special time and we want to make the most of that time. Like we don't want to get together to write and then have all of us sitting around being like, well, what should we do? You know what the Dropbox (laughs) does is it just gives us all this ammunition to when we do get into the room, like if we're like, hey, we're going to take a week and just be together and write, we'll, we'll have all this common language. We'll be able to say like, oh, like the the guitar part from this song, like, you know, do something like that. And we'll have all these starts. We'll have, you know, ammunition going in that way. It's we just hit the ground running as opposed to like getting there and being like, so what's everyone feeling? You know, because we've already <laughs> had that discussion before we get yeah. in the room, because for us, the magic that happens when we're in a room together is the quick stuff, the 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 stuff that could not happen, you know, if we were working like this, you know, remotely. The yeah. the like, oh, what's that? No, stop. Hold on, go back. Do do that thing. Or, you know, oh, that fill that you did last time, that was the one. Like, hold on, play that back. Like, 
oh, what if we like change the whole song based on that film? Like where we're all like screaming over each other, like just excited. That's, that's what we want to try to capture when we're together and just having a lot of ideas going into those writing times, uh, is, is key for that. I think. Yeah, definitely. I think, um, one of the tracks that like stands out for me, obviously, cause I'll, I really love synths and this is just me selfishly asking you, Chris, <laughs> is uh, in No Oasis, just the whole texture and then the the arps and piano. Mm-hmm. Um, is it hard? Like, I know you said, you know, the track kind of tells you w- what it should be. This doesn't feel like a guitar part and mm-hmm. vice versa. But I know I found myself, it's easy to just go, oh, I can add this this bottom layer of texture to everything. And mm-hmm. sometimes that's a bit too much. Mm-hmm. Um, is that hard to, well, I know it's not probably not hard to, uh, you know, decide on, but how do you know when that's right for you? for the band? It, It's really, it, it's a combination of it being a feel, um, and also just listening to the other guys, you know, yeah. um, you know, because I know that, you know, nobody in our band is like driven by ego in the writing process like nobody is like oh i need to have my part in here it's just like hey what's best for the song you know and everyone's okay with someone else saying like hey that's not right um but you know if you look at something like no oasis um that's a song that you know you said that a song kind of like you know has a way of letting you know what it should be you know we were initially going to turn that into like a a bigger thing. But as we were going, we we're just like, man, like this feels like it's just it. You know, you have this intro, you have a verse, you have like a kind of a chorus, another verse, another chorus, but then like we just go into this other thing right after that. And, you know, we wanted to keep that open. And, you know, aside from drums, you know, that song was all just my stuff. And um, that that one actually uh, came together in the studio. Like I was just there writing with the other guys, which normally I don't do a ton of. Um, But yeah, it, it, uh, yeah, I think it worked out really cool. Yeah. I I love that track. Thank you. Um, I remember uh, this is, I don't know, obviously the dreaded lockdown period, but um, you went live on Spitfire audios, YouTube channel. Yeah. Suggesting free plugins. Mm -hmm. Um, and obviously there's a vast range of free plugins and being fans of synths, you get that gear acquisition syndrome where you think, <laughs> Oh, I, I need that to, uh, Oh, I you know, know that one. This is the sound I need all of a sudden. Um, do you give yourself certain limitations or do you refrain from that? Because I know when I touch this synth, my hands usually go to the same spots to play similar things I have in the past. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. So, um, I think it's a, it's a, uh, uh, multifaceted question, you know, when you're, when you're talking about, you know, the gear acquisition syndrome, you know, I think I've fallen into that just as much as anyone else has and, you know, software and hardware, um, you know, so I think putting limits on that is good. Um, you know, I now, when I am itching, if there's some new instrument out that I'm itching for, I think like, okay, like, is there something that I've bought in the past year that I really haven't used? Like I haven't learned how to use properly. And, you know, that's something that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be better at, um, you know, just trying to get to know the stuff that I have intimately, uh, and, you know, be able to use it the way that it is intended to be used as opposed to just like knowing it on a surface level. But, um, as far as limitations on, you know, songwriting, you know, what you said is totally true. You know, like I think anybody, whether they're a guitar player, a piano player, whatever you do, like when you sit in front of your instrument, your fingers tend to go in certain places. You tend to favor certain types of progressions, that sort of thing. Um, so what I like to do is find different, uh, interfaces for software instruments. Like I have, um, I'll unplug it here. I have this thing, which is, uh, it's called a Sensel. Uh, it's, it's called a morph by this company called Sensel. And they have these different, um, overlays you can put on. And I have this on my desk all the time because it's laid out like a Buchla. Um, and when I put my hands on this, like, I don't know what, notes are where because it's it's not laid out like anything that you're used to. So a lot of times if I'm trying to, I have this on all the time, it's always just sitting right there. So when I'm on this thing and I'm trying to like 
pluck out a part to figure out where something should go. Sometimes I'll just turn and I'll start messing around on this because it'll start. It, it, it just, I call it a habit breaker. Like it's just, it just, makes me because when I have my hands on the keyboard, there's certain notes that I tend to not hit certain progressions. I tend to not go to, but with this, I'm going all by ear, um, which is, yeah, which I think is, is, is good, you know? And, um, you know, I have a, another thing called an Orba that is a similar, uh, you know, a similar thing that's, that's mostly touch based. So, um, yeah, I don't know. And, uh, you know, sometimes just, just changing different changing instruments, you know, maybe trying something on guitar, you know, if it's not working on keyboard, you know, because I'm not as familiar with guitar as I am with keyboard. So yeah, I think having limitations is, is, uh, is super important, particularly if you have a lot of equipment or programs to choose from, um, because, you know, you can just be just paralyzed by, the choices and, you know, being able to sit down and say, Hey, this is, this is the tool I'm going to use today is, is, is good. And, you know, it works out great in film because a lot of times, you know, ahead of time, I'll, you know, be talking to the director and, you know, we'll decide, okay, here's what this film is going to sound like. Here are the instruments we're using here, the instruments we're not using. So, um, like I did a, uh, uh, like a period piece called uh, this film called Whelm and it, you know, takes place in the twenties. So I knew automatically like, okay, no synth, no electronics. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be stringed instruments, headed instruments, woodwinds, things like that. So that writing for that was honestly refreshing because that, that like, you know, 70% of the stuff that I have, I couldn't use. So it was just, you know, I had to focus and yeah, that's important. Forcing you down like a, a different route. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. Well, that you could go down avenues like just going doing field recordings and getting just little samples like that and capturing stuff. So yeah, yeah. Yep. I, I can see it being yeah very refreshing. Speaking of um, sort of like sort of like knowing what to get with your your rig and all that sort of thing and keeping making sure you're not buying loads of synths and that. What? How did you choose what synths to use for your live rig and your live setup and like which ones do you rely on the most? So we're going to go into like gear like sort of territory yeah no um so i am extremely hard on everything that i play with live um you know the stuff gets wet it gets banged around um so i don't have any hardware synths uh in my live set at all um just because i i they're too uh precious to me and I won't, yeah. I don't want them on stage Makes with sense. me. <laughs> I, I don't trust myself <laughs> with them. <clears throat> but, um, uh, but what I do is I will sample stuff from, you know, the, the poly or the, the, you know, the Uno synth or the SEO two, like things that I've written on those things. I will sample like individual notes and that way that I can actually play them because I run everything live through main stage. Um, and then I have a, a, a Kai, uh, MPC live that I use as like a, a sampler. Um, and then I have three MIDI controllers running off of, uh, main stage and, you know, each song has different routings and, um, you know, cause I use the, uh, the M audio, uh, code 49 or sorry, no, they, I, I was using that the, uh, the oxygen, uh, 49 pro yeah. the new one that they have. It's, it's awesome. I have a, a 49 and I have a 25 of that. Um, and yeah, it's great because, you know, I do have to have a laptop on stage with me, which can be, uh, nerve wracking sometimes, but it's much better to me than having a bunch of, you know, analog gear and things like that. You know, if we yeah. were like on nine inch nails, Metallica level, and it's like, Oh, if my $5,000 synth, gets busted it's fine they'll just bring another one tomorrow then that would be a a (laughs) different situation but i'm not that way so um yeah so i run everything through main stage basically except for whatever's on my mpc um and then uh there's some stuff that i've routed over to our our guitar player has uh a uh strike pad and a kai strike pad um and he uses that for some synth stuff in a couple songs um yeah, but within main stage, I'm I'm using a ton of stuff. You know, I'm using uh, Omnisphere, 
mostly contact, uh, you know, for all of the stuff that I sample here, I do in contact. And then I would say probably 80%, 80% of my uh, VSTs are contact. So use a lot of contact, use massive. Um, I think I use some FM eight for some, for some older songs. Um, again, people who don't care about this stuff are just, it's just, it's, I, I sound like the, the parents from peanuts at this point, just blah, 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 blah. Do you have um, a favorite song that you've been playing live? Um, honestly, probably Hallelujah, um, because the just the reaction to that song live has been really, really good, and that's that's just a ton of fun. Um, and then uh, prob- that probably tied with Pneumonia. Um, yeah, I like playing Pneumonia yes. live. It's yeah, it's not. I wouldn't say it's fun, but it's cool. <laughs> like yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a. Uh, sometimes a rough one to get through like emotionally, but it's, uh, you know, it's, it's rad. I, I feel really cool playing it. So that, yeah, I guess that says something. Yeah. Honestly, I haven't seen anything cool. And, uh, John Carpenter up on stage, just dancing away with one hand on the synth and just Dude, he's, getting yeah, down with it. It's like, yes, yeah, he's so good. I love that guy. <laughs> How are you feeling towards the uh, last installment of the Halloween franchise coming up this year? So I haven't seen the last one yet. Ooh, uh, right, okay. I know, I know. It's just such a it's such a big hole in my uh, in my viewing history. I, I need to see it. Um, there was the uh, I think the, the 2016 one that came out. I thought that was uh, I thought that was good. Um, I'm interested to see where they take it. What what I'm thinking is since it's been, you know, whatever, a year, a year and a half since the last one came out and I still haven't yeah. seen it, I might just wait and watch yeah. that one like yeah, maybe yeah. the night before I go see the new one because I'll, I'll probably Makes go see sense, the new yeah. one opening night. Uh, so uh, I will go see it. I'm stoked, but I'm not like... Uh, my expectations aren't super high, which I think is probably a good thing. Um, yeah. I'm not going in being like, man, show me something amazing. I can't wait. Like if I go in and it's a fun time at the movies, I'll, I'll take it, you know? Uh, but if I'm just pleasantly surprised and it's like just some top tier horror filmmaking, then yeah, then I'm, I'm in for it. What, what are some of your go-to scores? Oh boy. Um, Sorry, I'm just dropping that one on you there. No, no, I love it. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, <laughs> yeah, honestly, the the Johan Johansson score for Arrival is is always up there. Um, uh, honestly, the the Titanic score is always up there. You know, James Horner's amazing. Uh, John Murphy's score for Twenty Eight Weeks Later. Um, that's nice. always yeah, yeah. one for me. Um, the Annihilation score is awesome. Uh, I think what uh, Colin Stetson did with the latest Texas Chainsaw Massacre is great. Yeah. Um, you know, say what you will about the movie. I know you know some people like it more than others, but that score I think is undeniable. Like he's he's a he's a madman. I I love that guy. Yeah, that definitely stood out when I was watching it. Um, I like that movie. Did, you know, besides the ending. <laughs> yeah, it was yeah. fun. Like I I yeah, yeah I just. You know, I had similar expectations for that as I do Halloween, where I went in being like, all right, I don't think I'm going to be like bowled over and like blown away, but just, you know, show me some fun stuff. Let me have a good time. And and I did. So, uh, yeah, I think that's important. I think a lot of fans get too precious about franchises when the original still exists and they can still go watch that. Agreed. Yeah. I, I don't get super precious about a, about a whole lot of stuff, uh, uh, yeah, I just kind of go in and if I have a good time, great. And if I don't, yeah. Oh, well, th- th- there'll always be another one. <laughs> yeah. So, um, while we're on films, I'm guessing for you, the earlier you get onto a film and involved in the project, the better. Um, but do you have a preference from working directly from the script to come up with ideas or is it usually a reference track? 
Yeah. So, uh, that also varies by project. Um, yeah. you know, there have been films that I've done that I've been brought on super early, like in the script phase and then other films where I'm like handed a, a locked edit basically. Uh, and that's my first time seeing it. Um, you know, there are pros and cons to both. You know, I used to think that I, you know, Hey, the earlier, the better, you know, always, you know, that that's always going to be better no matter what. Uh, but you know, there was a, uh, a film that I did where I was brought on, you know, just after the script phase, you know, it was when they were just about to go into production. I wrote probably 15 different cues uh, for this movie because I thought I had an idea of like, you know, what it needed to be. And then um, I saw the first like rough assembly cut and I was just like, oh, I was off. Like none of this stuff is going to work. And that, that was a lot of work that went into stuff that just never ended up getting used for anything. So, you know, when I was in the middle of working on that movie, I was like, man, I wonder if like this, you know, waiting until I have an edit to, to work is like the way to go. But like, I, I, it's not how I prefer to work. Like if, if schedule and budget allow, you know, I, I would love to be brought on super early, um, you know, around, you know, script phase and be able to like bounce ideas back and forth with the director. You know, I think that's always going to be the way to go. Like, um, the, uh, director for Whelm, he's in the middle of, uh, you know, doing stuff for the, for his new film. And, you know, we've been going back and forth on music stuff for the past, you know, f- gosh, six months. Um, you know, it's nothing like official. It's more so just like, Hey, like, what do you think this world sounds like? And those, those times are like the most exciting for me. Like when I'm like, just trying to figure out what the sound is going to be like, what does this world feel like, you know? And yeah, I, I love that. I think it's hard because sometimes you can put all those hours into, you know, not just creating cues, but you know, Oh, I'll create, you know, a piano with a, a bunch of effects that sounds completely different to what people hear mm-hmm. but then the picture influences what you write and what you've written also influences the story and stuff yeah and again i think that if if uh schedule and budget are there it doesn't really matter you know um yeah. you know as as long as i'm able to spend the time you know i i'll i'll i don't care if i work for a month and you know almost nothing ends up getting used and we end up pivoting. Like if I'm, if the budget is there, then that's fine. You know, I, because it's all just a stepping stone to whatever the end product's going to be, you know? And if I, if you have to do, you know, 50 things wrong to find the right thing, then I, I take that as a, a win usually. Yeah. So, yeah. Total, uh, total side note, but um, have you guys seen, they released, uh, I think a new trail trailer for Pearl. No, um, no. No? You guys saw X, right? I'm assuming? I haven't. I know I haven't. I am behind on films. Oh, I am the same. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, well, well, yeah, never mind then. I won't, uh, I won't say anything more. <laughs> Pretend no like I didn't say anything. Go watch <laughs> X, though. If Yeah. Yeah, I've heard it's really good. Like, it's a slasher, right? Yeah. Yeah. But, but it also does... It does some wild stuff that uh, not not super wild, but it 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 tackles themes and ideas that I can say uh, I had never seen really addressed before in, in any oh, film, okay. which I thought was was really interesting. So um, yeah, okay. Well, I don't want to talk any more about that because <laughs> I don't want to spoil anything. But uh, yeah, go watch X. Yeah, I think we, uh, that's our homework from this podcast. Go watch yeah. X, which yeah. I think we can manage. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm jealous because you've seen Nope and it's not out over here yet. Oh, it's oh, not. You, oh, you've seen, you've seen Nope. Oh, I is did. It over the, is it out? Over, oh, no yeah. way. Yeah. No. Yeah. Uh, I went and saw. No spoilers, please. So, <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. No spoilers. Um, I really enjoyed it. Um, there is, uh, you know, the imagery that's there, like, there's some imagery that I think is like all time great. Um, cause I forget the, I forget the name of the cinematographer on it. Um, he, he, he worked on uh, Dunkirk. Um, he worked on, I think one of the, one of the Batman movies, I think he's, he's amazing, but, uh, some of this, yeah, cinematography is, is wild. Performances are really good. Um, th- it, it takes a turn that I was, uh, not expecting 
And when I realized what they were doing, I, I went with, uh, with my wife and some friends, I leaned over to my wife and I was like, I've never seen this done ever. Like, this is really cool, which, which I think is rad. Um, and there is, uh, some genuinely disturbing imagery, which I love. Like if, if some, if I can see something and without it being like over the top, like gore fest, you know, cause I, I feel like a lot of directors try to do that. It's like, Hey, I'm going to show you like a razor blade going to an eye or something like that. But mm-hmm. there is like just some imagery that's not wicked gore, but it was just disturbing. Like when I was, there's one shot in particular, it's, it's within the first few minutes of the movie. Um, I was, I like sat back. I was like, Oh man, that's, that's yeah. weird. You know, and I, I, I agree. There's, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of horror movies nowadays that will just go straight in for like the gore fest. But like another film that hit me like that hit you, that sort of aspect was Midsummer with yeah. the cliff scene. Like oh, when dude. I saw that for the first time, I was like, shit. <laughs> this yeah. is heavy. Dude, that movie yeah. is, uh, I, I love, you know, and the, the score for that movie, I, I, I love that. Uh, but that, that movie overall, I think, is, is great. I don't think it's, um, to, for me, I think Hereditary is still. Uh, I, I like hereditary more, uh, but you know, anything that that guy does, I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to be buying a ticket opening night, uh, probably forever. <laughs> yeah. He's Ari Aster and Joe <laughs> both uh, the same. Oh, I'll go. sign up for anything. Yeah. Yeah, no, for, yeah, for sure. Um, uh, you know, cause I feel like they both had such strong debuts that, you know, I, and honestly, M night Shyamalan is the same for me. Like he, he's done a handful of movies that in my opinion are just, anti good like not good but i go see everything that he does because i know that you know when he hits he hits and yeah. for for me that's just you know it, it, it's you worth have it a favorite m night film um oh boy after earth no I'm joking um no i no i think uh i think i have to say uh the sixth sense just because yeah. it's it's just an all timer yeah. you know but i genuinely love the village i think the village is great um one. one of my favorite movie going experiences of all time was going and seeing split in the theater um yes. yeah. because i saw that opening night and oh, nice. i'm uh I won't spoil anything for for whoever's listening that has not seen Split, but there's a reveal at the end which I was not I was not expecting any mm. sort of crazy reveal and when the reveal happened I literally stood up in the theater. I was <laughs> I was so <laughs> pumped. Um and I actually just 2 nights ago I revisited The Happening um because I think that in so many ways that movie doesn't work. Like it's just, it's so odd. The performances are not great overall. Uh, but I think that that has some of the scariest footage that he has ever put to film. Like the, the, the death scenes in that movie are just, they they still get under my skin thinking about them. You know, you've got the, you know, the, the guys on the roof, the, the, um, the, uh, construction workers. And then, you know, you've got the girl in central park with like her hair needle and like yeah. the whole scene with the gun where everybody keeps picking up the same gun. Like all that stuff is like some of the, probably the most memorable stuff that he's ever done for me. Uh, but again, and we're all wrapped up in a movie that I don't particularly care for but it's a fun watch you know just watching everybody try to like yeah try to just be super serious looking at trees say, blowing you know spot for uh, unbreakable oh it's great i i i just really trilogy like it. in general yeah what'd you think of glass mm. <laughs> yeah That's, yeah i felt the there were certain aspects to it was cool. It was great seeing him back in them roles after that long anyway. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. But it's not, it didn't wrap up the way I, that's the thing with opinion when it comes to filming. It's not the way that I want it. Yeah. Um, if like, I was editing it, I if, would have done this. If I was editing this multi-million dollar film, <laughs> I would have done differently. Um, no, but I think just in terms of 
uh, Bruce Willis's character. It, it just didn't go the way I expected it to. Mm-hmm. But then again, that's my opinion. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I I thought it was it was cool. I I like Split so much more. Um, well, I guess that's the spoiler if anybody hasn't seen Split. But uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I I, mean, I I feel like they should have watched it by yeah, now. It's yeah, been a while. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I I love it. My I went and saw Nope the other night, and my daughter actually asked me when I got home if uh, if she could go see it with me. Uh, like she she wants to go see it, so I think uh, yeah. I don't know how I got back to Nope just now, but I it literally just popped into my brain. Sorry, <laughs> nothing wrong no, with that. <laughs> on, a, on on that night though, I think Signs for me is one of those standout like Alien films, like Alien abduction yeah. one. Like it's, it's it's very rarely mentioned when, when people bring up like Alien abduction films because obviously you've got like Independence Day and all those other ones. But Fire in yeah, the Sky. It, what's that one? Sorry, Fire in the Sky. Yeah, that's that that's the number one for me. Like just it's horrifying and just so everybody's seen that right everybody here has seen that fire in the sky i haven't wa- i haven't watched that one yet no <sighs> it was a while ago since i was oh mate i've got a big i've got a, like a list going on here wow. so, I mean, this is brilliant yeah <laughs> no we fi- horror fest five or four oh, <laughs> or something man. That as well. <laughs> yeah no fire in the sky is just that's it like wh- i went into nope wondering if uh, that would dethrone Fire in the Sky as as my like favorite alien movie, and uh, yeah, I won't say whether it did or not, but um, uh, yeah, watch Fire in the Sky. Gosh, I'm I'm so glad that you're going to experience <laughs> that movie for the first 100%. time. With um, you know, with you getting to go see Nope, how's it been getting to go to premieres for movies that you've been a part of? <laughs> Uh, stressful and awesome. Um, yeah, it's, it's very stressful. Uh, like uh, I had, a have had a film in, uh, the Tribeca film festival for the past two years. And like what I had one, two years ago and then a different film this, this year. And I was there for the premieres of both of those. And, um, it's weird being in a room with people and just, you know, the the film is a group effort, obviously, Um, you know, and a million people have to come together to make it happen. But, you know, each person's part in that film is like on full display in real time in a theater full of people. So it's like, you know, there's really, you can't hide behind anything. It's just like, okay, I'm sitting in this room around all these people and they're like watching this thing and listening to the thing that I did. Um, And honestly, it's super cool though. Like, um, you know, it's, it's what I've wanted to do forever. And the fact that, you know, I've, I've been able to do a movie, let alone multiple is, is yeah, it's crazy. I just, I'm just such a movie nerd and, uh, you know, I just love going to the movies and the fact that, you know, anything that I've done is seen by people in a movie theater or at home on their TV is, uh, yeah, really, yeah, really cool. Was it like watching it, obviously listening to your own, your own like sort of like compositions back, knowing what you, what's coming next and what you're going to expect and hearing it in those big cinema venues as well? Because if, if I was you, I'd be sitting in anticipation, just waiting for those parts to come in and just to see how they, they sound in there as well. I guess it, the, the, the reaction to those things is different based on how well the, the, the theater is tuned you know because sometimes like it just doesn't sound the way it's supposed to um yeah. you know but i think you know as a musician you can or you know any sort of audio you know engineer or whatever you get really like fine-tuned on like oh that you know that's supposed to go to the sub and you know i can't feel that part and like i get way too granular with that with that sort of thing <laughs> uh but yeah overall the experience of uh you know hearing it big and loud is always uh yeah always really cool i find it strange to actually hearing it in that um, sort of environment because I remember a couple of months about me and uh, Matty with the Halloween posters behind him. Uh, we went what we went to like a not necessarily a screening, but it was um, Jeff Buckley's Grace, but in a cinema where it was okay. like this thing where you basically put a blindfold on and you listen to the album in full. That's cool. And it was um, mm. like just every finer detail that I'd never heard before, like mm-hmm. all these years about listening on my iPod or Spotify or wherever it was and. It just hearing it in that aspect was just a completely different experience. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And and what's funny is 
there's times when I will get a completely different sense of a piece that I've written, but only for the first time when I'm watching it with people, because I'm like, Oh, like that's what this piece is doing in this film, you know, because I think you can get so micro, you know, trying to make sure that the, you know, this track sounds right. And you know, that the mixing is good here, blah, blah, blah. And like, but then when you zoom out and you're just watching it, as a, as a whole, you're realizing like, Oh, like all those decisions that we made early on about what this should sound like. And, you know, these changes that we made that all came together just so that when this character does this thing, we feel a certain thing, you know, and that's all, that's all what it comes down to. And, you know, but yeah, sometimes, uh, can't see the forest for the trees when I'm in this room by myself for, you know, months (laughs) working on something, I'm just, you know, hitting my head against the wall. Do you have, um, like a dream project that you'd love to score or compose for, whether that's a series, movie, or game? Oh, so many, so many. <laughs> um, I I have a thing that I've talked to my wife about forever that I would love to be able to work on. Because uh, whenever we watch like a, a Netflix show, we, we, we like to have the subtitles on a lot of times. And um, whenever it says ominous music plays, um, I always tell her where I'm like, I'm going to have my own ominous music plays one of these days. So, yeah, being able to do, uh, you know, something for, uh, you know, like a Netflix show or something like that would be amazing. Um, you know, honestly, like Black Mirror, that is like yeah. that's my completely my lane so if i got to do something like that that would be great um you know if i were to i i would really just like to work on a video game you know i did a little bit of video game stuff a couple years ago and that was cool but it was more of like a title sequence it wasn't like into the nitty gritty of it um so you know working on any video game i think would be great and then you know as far as you know dream projects and film um my, my absolute dream would be to do something either with Danny Boyle or uh, John Murphy, um, the composer John Murphy, because th- those two guys are directly responsible for me taking this career path at all, um, because I went and saw uh, Sunshine in the theater and I walked out of it and I said, you know, that's that's what I want to do for a job. And uh yeah, so if I could, that that would just be a, a full circle universe moment if I ever did anything with either of those guys. So, uh, yeah. Nice. Um, one thing I definitely want to bring up is, obviously, you saying you're alone in that room for hours sometimes. How is it collaborating and adding additional music to Orphan First Kill? That was great um, because, uh, you know, the composer, Brett, um, you know, I've been friends with him forever and we had always kind of flirted around with doing something um, together and it just hadn't really worked out yet. And um, I, I mean, I, I don't think any of this is like a secret. Uh, so I'll just go ahead and say like, it, I got a call from him because at the time I was working, I was finishing up another film and he was working on orphan and we were, he's one of those guys where we just text back and forth pretty frequently about like, Oh, like, have you ever used this plugin for this thing? Or like, you know, Hey, what do you do when you, when you have this problem? Like, how do you fix it? That sort of thing. And we had, um, similar schedules cause he was in LA, I was in Florida and we were both pulling super late nights and he called me one night and was just like, Hey, like, you know, we've got this deadline coming up and, you know, I'm not going to be able to hit it. Um, you know, do you want to come on for the last, last like five weeks or so? And basically we'll just work together to get to the end. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it was like an immediate yes. Like I was just like, dude, of course. Like that would be that would be so fun. And you know, it it was at the same time, you know, working on a, a a cool film, but also us being able to finally do a project together. So that was rad. And um, you know, what worked great in that film is um, he had written everything up until that point. It, there was like two uh, two tempos, and I think two keys. So he sent me all the stuff that he had written at that point as stems. And, you know, I got, uh, you know, particular scenes and reels and, um, 
I did basically a bunch of Lego stuff with the stuff that he had written where I'm like, okay, like, let's see what works here and what doesn't. And, you know, there'd be times where I would bring like, oh, the percussion from this cue that you have is really cool. And the string line is really cool, but the other stuff doesn't work. So let's bring those in. And then I would write something on top of that. And then I would send it to him. And it was, you know, it's, it's his score. You know, I was just able to come in and like, you know, like I said, just, you know, move yeah. tracks around, have, a, I think my official titles, you know, additional composition by, you know, cause I did write, you know, a, a decent bit, but, um, you know, but it was really just, you know, bringing his score to where it needed to be. And, you know, thankfully he's awesome at what he does. So it wasn't a ton of, it, I mean, it's a lot of work. I mean, it was long days and, you know, like I said, it took us, I think it was like four or five weeks straight, uh, with like, had like one or two days off. Um, so it was a lot of work, but it was, uh, yeah, it was great. And the movie's dope, which is, like I said, that's the coolest thing. Like being in a spot where you don't have to preface, what you're doing be like, Oh, the movies look whatever, but you know, take a listen to the music. It's more so like, Hey, watch this movie. It's cool. And I got to, I got to help out on it. So, yeah. I think that's something, I mean, you occasionally see it, but definitely something I'm not aware of is collaboration in soundtracks, Mm -hmm. um, you know, for scoring. And I'd like you coming on board, like definitely would have as all collaboration, you know, put, a different perspective for Brett. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm excited to see the new Orphan film. Yeah, yeah. This one scared the shit out of me. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's really cool. Um, it's it's cool. I I wasn't sure what to expect. Um, and then you know they sent they sent it over and um, it you know obviously can't give anything away, but it, it goes yeah. places that I didn't expect, um, which I thought was really cool. There were things that happened that genuinely surprised me and i was like oh that's what's happening okay cool let's let's go for it it's yeah it's 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 rad nice i'm excited me too but i'm biased (laughs) (laughs) yeah i know we touched upon it a little before but obviously i can see you've got a mass collection going on like when when did you start doing that and have you got any like bits in there that you love in particular um i don't know when i started honestly it was probably back in like 20 13 2014 ish um i've got uh well i've got some there that are screen used um so which is like like i said earlier you know if i if i do a film that has a mask in it i try to get the mask from the director so like i did a film called bad candy and that's uh right there mask from that and yeah. then um, this one here, uh, like the the white one, that's from a yeah. movie called uh, 1031 that a friend of mine scored. Um, I was able to snag that from, from him because I thought it was cool. And then um, there's a fencing mask up here that yeah. uh, it was kind of a, a, a plot point in uh, that film Whelm that I did. Um, and then the other ones are just ones that I've acquired, except there's one that we received as a gift for selling out a, uh, a venue on the last under oath tour. Like they, cause a lot of venues, like if you come and you sell it out, they'll, they'll, they'll bring you like a cake or, uh, you know, a little gift or whatever. And this venue mm-hmm. in particular, they, uh, they, they commissioned local artists to do art pieces for bands that sell the venue out and they happen to get like a head and this artist painted uh little bits from each of our album art on this uh head oh, cool. and then put that's like sick. a put like a oxygen right. mask on it so as soon as we opened it everybody was like oh we know who's gonna get this blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah but but i'm a big fan of masks that are like you know i have a like one from the this one up here can't really see it but it's from the the texas chainsaw remake that the oh three remake oh three one yeah yeah, yeah. yeah um yeah. i really i mean it sounds like so morbid but i love masks that are to be human skin like like skin yeah. masks like yeah, this yeah. one here on the on the end right here that's probably my favorite one because it, it's like it it fits my face perfect and it's like it's human hair and um you know it's 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 multiple pieces um and the guy that that did it his name's addison um if anybody wants to see his stuff is uh he's on instagram and all that's addison morare m-o-r-r-a-r-e um and he's just 
yeah, wicked talented. And, you know, he's the same guy that's doing the, the Mason Verger mask for me. So, um, yeah. That's sick. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's a nothing hobby. It's just like, Oh, this looks cool. I'll, I'll, I'll put them up in my office. My, my kids aren't huge fans of them, but, um, you know, Hey, it's fine. That's when you get left alone in the studio, Chris. Yeah, that's the, yeah, and, and that's the yeah punishment if the kids are bad. <laughs> Got to go in daddy's studio. Yeah, man, it's another uh, form to appreciate though. Like just even the little details and stuff that goes into the mask makes a movie, or yeah, things like like Tom Savini, like doing the work he's done in all those films and mm-hmm. some of the masks he's produced, even the newest Slipknot mask that he worked on as well. Yeah, like, that just the little bits the like that just, he's done just make it, yeah. In terms of uh, Slipknot mask, like that fucking new Kari mask is like fucking right there. <laughs> well, Sid's whole new thing I think is really cool, where it's just basically like a, a severed head of himself and he's like the robot. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's so cool. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's that's awesome. Okay, well, the, I guess since we're, since we're talking about this, uh, favorite movie mask? Ooh. Again, you've dropped, so that's a <laughs> that's bomb a you've dropped. dropped there, oh, it's yeah. easy for me. Uh, Freddy. Well, the, he, he would technically wasn't a mask, though. That was his face. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. But, like, I'm saying, like, mask, like, the character mm. was wearing a mask. Right, right. Well, obviously, my favorite film is Halloween, so I'd, I'd obviously go for Halloween, even though it's probably a generic pick, but that's what I collect the most of anyway. Yeah, but yeah. I really, really loved the uh, the Halloween uh, the newer Halloween mask when they, they sort of made it look older, but it, you know what I mean? It's got like gritty, like sort of look to it. And mm-hmm. Chris, Chris Nelson did, did the mask for the newer Halloween films. And even the, the kills one with the burnt side of the face and that, I just love how that, so, that came out yeah. and the new trailer for ends, the newer mask in that looks menacing as fuck when you see the, uh, when you see parts of it in the trailer, depending on the lighting as well on the masks. Yeah. It could, yeah. It just changes the whole thing. But yeah, I'd probably say like, yeah. The Captain Kirk converted into yeah, yeah. it. Uh, <laughs> the Myers, William Shatner mask. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. For me, I think I really love um, Friday the 13th too. Sack Jason. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I like the nod to the town that dreaded sundown kind of thing. Yeah. But I also love Halloween 3. So all three of those masks for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that, that's not that really for mind, a villain. And I've completely forgot the name of the fucking film. I'm trying to think what it's called off the top of my head. <laughs> what about yours, Chris? Oh man, um, I, I should have probably had like a, an answer ready um, if I was going to uh, to ask. Um, man, honestly, I think some of the masks in the Strangers are oh, oh, yeah. very, yeah. very yeah. good. Um, the like porcelain doll looking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think those are really cool. Um Yeah, again, it's another Sackman in the the Strangers as well, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Again, yeah, just wh- something about it being very plain, just very simplistic, but it's menacing at the same time. It's just creepy. Yeah. Um Man. Going back to Slipknot, that's why I like Sid's mm. like uh, gas masks and stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's that like face without being a face kind of thing. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think uh, yeah, um, Ghost Face is probably what I mean. The Hannibal Lecter mask, I think, is probably an all timer. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but but it, I think that that one is not so much the mask as it is like his eyes under the mask. Like the mask itself is like whatever, yeah. but yeah, his his eyes under the mask or what what makes that so yeah yeah what about you then Lon? have you fought of one yet you'll probably be able to jog my memory on this yeah we watched it at yours it was a horror film where basically a robber goes in to steal jewelry and then it ends oh, up being as the guy the collector the collector oh yeah right. the collector mask that yeah. mask oh that is, is a good one that is a good one spoke, yeah yeah that film in general is creepy <laughs> I'm actually looking up right now because I'm. Tr- I know that there's some that I'm missing, and yeah. I am gonna. Ki- I know I'm gonna kick myself when we get done with this. And there's, <laughs> there's some. There's some that I haven't. Uh, yeah, I completely forgot about the collector. The collector mask. You see his eyes behind that as well. Yeah. It's just pure black. Yeah. It's Freaky. like the material think... of the actual mask itself. It just look. It's just mm. unsettling. Just the whole thing. Yeah. Vibe of yeah. It's awful. Oh, the Rise like... of Leslie Vernon mask is really good too. Oh, I don't think I've seen that. Mm. Yeah, that one's good. I'm Googling this. 
<laughs> Dead air. <laughs> quick Google break in the, in the podcast. Yeah. Don't worry about the listeners. We're, uh, we're just here to... <laughs> That's why we need a Jamie. Oh, to that, find oh to I have seen this mask. Yeah, I've seen this mask oh, before. Oh, that is fucking... That. Yeah, and the original Leatherface mask. I mean, that's that's an all-timer as yeah. well. Yeah. I mean, the new Leatherface mask was interesting. Yeah, have, have you seen cool, that? Yeah. Um, there's a meme going around that, you know, that shot of him in the field where he's holding the mask up and like the sun's yeah. coming yeah. through. It says uh, the only proper way to eat a fruit roll up. And it's like him <laughs> holding it up. It's yeah, it's yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> um, that actually brings us around to a reoccurring segment we have with guests. What is your favorite scary movie? Oh, gosh. Yeah, I'm big, sorry. <laughs> one? I got to pick one. Um, we could do a top five if you'd like. Okay, let's do top five. <laughs> that, I, would, I would much prefer that. Um, I'd have to say The Shining uh, for sure. Um, Scream 1. Uh, the Exorcist. Yes. Um, <laughs> man. I I really think I have to put Hereditary up there. Um, and then today I will say the Blair Witch Project. Oh, nice. Yeah, that's like him. Yeah, I'm just I'm just thinking about movies that, uh, for the most part, anyway, that scared me a lot when I when I saw them initially. But Scream's not one of those. But Scream is just so fun. Like, gosh, I just I love it so much. What did you make of the uh, Scream Five? I thought it was cool. Like I didn't, I didn't love it. I didn't, I didn't hate it. Um, it's uh, yeah, I thought it was cool. I was uh, there was a a character who didn't make it to the end of the movie. No spoilers, but I was not super stoked on that. But mm-hmm. you know, I get that you have to have stakes. So you know, yeah. it, it 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 is what it is. It, it didn't piss me off as much as them killing randy off in scream too yeah they, yeah that felt uh, way, way more unnecessary <laughs> <laughs> we need to kill time well let's kill someone yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah no. i feel like uh scream 2 and scream 5 are very similar anyway so yeah very yeah I'm, I'm, I'm stoked yeah. on the next one i uh yeah I, I i can't wait for that to come out me and my wife that's uh one of the only movies that uh we we tend to make sure that we go see in the theater together when they come out um because yeah. normally our movie taste doesn't line up uh a ton so <laughs> yeah scream is the exception yeah okay so i was i was debating whether or not i was going to tell this story because it's it's a little embarrassing but it's such a good story it has to do with scream so me and my wife, the new Scream movie's coming out, and we, uh, you know, we get a babysitter. We're like making a whole night of it. We go out to dinner. We're so excited. We go opening night, and we're in the theater, and it's a pretty, it's a pretty packed theater. And um, uh, we realize about five minutes into the movie that we're sitting in front of like the guy you do not want to be sitting anywhere near in the movie, where he's like talking to his friend next to him, but not like whispering. He's like full voice talking oh, no. fairly no, constant, but he's talking like he's asking questions like he's that guy where he's like, wait, who's that? Oh, wait, where are they going? <laughs> That's oh, what's <laughs> happening here? Like, yeah, yeah, and he's just like asking his friend all these questions. And uh, I didn't know until about halfway through the movie, but uh, my wife leans over and she's like, that dude is like kicking my seat every three minutes. And she's like getting annoyed. And like, there was a sense like, you know, how you can get a vibe in a theater. Like if somebody's doing something like that, where people are like sighing and like squirming yeah. and it's just like, nobody mm-hmm. wants to say anything. Um, and I told my wife, I was like, well, hey, if he kicks your seat again, uh, you know, say something. She kicked, he kicked her seat again and she didn't say anything to me, but she turned around and gave him the like, hey, look, like, you know, like she didn't say anything, but she was like, oh, like oh, turned wow. around. Yeah. yeah. He, he didn't look at her. He didn't acknowledge that she had even turned around. He was just still just like, you know, talking to his friend and all this stuff and just asking the most ridiculous questions. And, and I was like, I was like, tell me if he does it again and I'll say something. I was like, I know it's uncomfortable, but it shouldn't be kicking your seat. 
This will turn into the opening of the Scream 2. Yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, he kicks her seat again, and she's like, he just kicked my seat again. So I turned around, and I was like, excuse me, like like in a pretty loud voice. And he like pulled his feet back, and like he, again, he didn't look at me, didn't acknowledge that I had turned around. He just like pulled his feet back and um, just kind of kept doing what he was doing. And it got that kind of happened throughout the entire movie. Like he would make comments probably every five minutes to his friend about like, you know, Oh, where are they going? Oh wait, was he in the, he was in the second one, right? Like that sort of stuff. So the end of the movie comes and there's a scene where I I don't want to give any spoilers for the movie, but it's the scene at the end of every horror movie where they're, they're at at the ambulance, you know, the survivors are in the back of the ambulance. There's a, there's a, a blanket over them. And there's a character who has been in all of the screen movies who is giving like a monologue at the end. And you guys know who I'm talking about. If you've seen the movie and he leans over to his friend and he was like, wait, who is that? And my wife turns around and she goes, have you not been watching the freaking movie? And (laughs) dude, okay, no. She said, have you not been watching the fucking movie? That's what she said. (laughs) And she said it in a pretty, not in a super loud voice. No, sorry. Let me, let me, let me clarify. She looked at me and said in a voice loud enough for everybody to hear, has he not been watching the fucking movie? That's what she said. And everybody around us laughed because it was just like all this tension, like everybody knows what, you know, this guy's just (laughs) annoying, right? And, uh... But it was at the end of the movie, so we're like, all right, you know, it's it, the movie's over. It's not going to be any more uncomfortable than it already is. So the movie gets done, and we're getting up to leave, and I'm like, I got to get a look at this guy and just, you know, because he's been a bane of my existence for the past, like, hour and a half, right? I turn around. He stands up. He unfolds his walking cane, his blind person walking cane, and makes his way out he is a completely blind person oh, and shit. we <laughs> we felt oh. we felt uh pretty uh pretty bad but it, but at the same time it's like hey oh. maybe whisper to your friend you know <laughs> yeah definitely. oh my god oh. <laughs> yeah it was it was pretty uh pretty intense oh jesus christ <laughs> yeah, good times. wow I don't know. Maybe that's not a great story to tell. I don't know. <laughs> no, that's, that's, that's a good story. <laughs> yeah, it's a good story. <laughs> no, oh, we had a similar similar uh, situation watching the when the new Halloween came out. The first, you know, the 2018 one went to the midnight showing, and there was just a group of lads in there just chatting away, and it was on the phones and like talking to people down the phones. You, you, was you two there for it? I can't remember. I was just one of you. Uh, I was there. Yeah. 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 And they were just chatting down the phones for the whole thing. I'm thinking, fuck, man, like, why would you come to a midnight showing, like, the first screening? Exactly, And then yeah. chat on a phone for it? Like, what, what's the point? Why are you here? Like, you go to a midnight showing because you want to enjoy the full experience and see it first. Yeah. So, yeah, it blocked me out. That's a pet peeve of mine. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, when, when we came out of Scream, we had called a friend of ours to tell him what had happened because we were like just laughing at how ridiculous the whole situation was. And my friend was like, yeah, but that guy like, A, he could have like whispered to his friend instead of talking full voice or could have gone to one of the screenings that have like the descriptions for blind yeah. people yeah. or could have gone to like an afternoon screening when it's not full of people. But he went like the opening mm-hmm. night, 8 p.m., <laughs> You know, and then just going for it. And, you know, hey, more power to him. Uh, But I told my wife that, you know, that that like it ruined the movie for us because, you know, I haven't seen the movie (laughs) since and I need to watch it again. Um, But at the same time, you know, we would not have been talking about that movie going experience in, you know, a year later, uh, you know, if something like that didn't happen. So I'll take it. Yeah, I (laughs) I think the worst one I ever had was... um, I went watching A Quiet Place 2, and a couple decided to turn up absolutely hammered, and just no consideration for the surroundings, and I thought, of all films to, like... Be loud in. (laughs) This is the one you do not talk (laughs) through. But no, yeah. Oh, that sucks. I'll I'll still go to the movies every time, though. Like, I just, I love... 
you know, even though there's, you know, there are those bad experiences, you know, it's just, yeah, it's, it's my favorite place. So. So whilst uh, uh, Matty mentioned it, we do have a, another recurring segment where we uh, ask you, uh, what's your pet peeve? What pisses you off the most? It could be like the most smallest little thing, but it counts if it. If it well, I got you off. I got two uh, that I think are probably tied. One of them is this is such a dad thing of me, but I hate when because we live in Florida and it's hot here like all the time, and when my kids go in or out of the house and they just leave the door open. Like I just see like money flowing out the door. It's such a dad thing. I know but I'm like, just like, close the door, like just close the door. Um, but equal to that would be, uh, I don't like being late for things. Um, like I'm very anal about being on time. And then when, when people are, uh, late. That's a, that's a pet peeve, especially when it's okay. So here's the thing. Like, say you have to be some, say something starts at eight o'clock. I'm meeting all three mats for a movie at eight o'clock. I get a call from all three mats at eight 58 or sorry, seven 58 saying, Hey, we're going to be about 30, 40 minutes late. I think, okay, well you knew th- 40 minutes ago you were going to be late because you know like yeah. you know that that whole thing that's yeah. a pet peeve of mine like you know I don't mind so much if somebody's late if they let you know like way ahead of time like hey sorry yeah. something came up uh you know let's do another showing something like that but but the uh hey it takes me 30 minutes to get to my house to get there from my house and I'm calling you one minute before to let you know I'm going to be 30 minutes late because I'm leaving my house now it's like you should have called me a half hour ago because you knew you were going to be late <laughs> but knowing for a fact that y'all are already there as yes well. yeah yeah that's yeah. that's a big pet peeve but they both make me just sound like an old man shaking my fist at the sky but no, you know no, the no, reasonable no. very <laughs> reasonable, reasonable. <laughs> as a friend yeah. of ours who um he doesn't like it where if you say, oh, what time are you getting wherever? And if you go like, oh, it'll be about eight-ish. Mm-hmm. He hates like the ish because there's no like set time on it being like it is eight o'clock, quarter past or whatever. If that ish is the uncertainty that you don't <laughs> know when exactly you're going to be turning up, but it will be in the realms around eight. <laughs> yeah, see, when I hear ish, that tells me it's a 10 minute one way or the other. Anytime yeah. from 750 to 810, that's that's acceptable. Um, like we have a friend that will literally like it'll be like, hey, uh, we're doing dinner at our house next Tuesday at five o'clock. And he's like, Well, okay, you know, we'll be there. But you know us, like it'll probably be five thirty, closer to six. And I'm like, it's next week. You can't just plan to leave a little sooner to get here on time. Like they just like accept that they're going to be late everywhere. And yeah. I can't imagine living my life that way. Like, like, Oh man, I love them though. Like one of my favorite people, uh, except for that. To be fair, I myself, I'm a partner are guilty for that. We're right. Everyone knows us the people that are always late to everything. You two can probably testify to this. Yeah. You're either still in the shower or eating your tea. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, so I'm like, right, we're doing this. We're breaking the stereotype. We are going to be on time every time we fail. We are always late. Like there is like no fault to it. I don't know how it happens. Something happens. I always end up being like. So, are you one of the guys who does the thing where you say, "Okay, it is a ten minute drive." Okay, we got to be somewhere at eight. <laughs> it's a ten minute drive from my house to this place. We have to be there at eight. So I'm going to leave my house at seven fifty. Is that your your move? To be fair, I, I, I don't know if I'm uh, is that, yeah. 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 Me. Well, that's his move. You either say, yeah, I am one of them people, or if I'm not one of them people. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I think because my, my dad was in the military, so that's kind of how I I grew up. So I was all it was always like drilled into my head. It's like, okay, we have to be there at eight. It's a ten minute drive. You leave at seven forty. That way, if you have to stop and get gas or if you hit every red light or whatever, you're still there on time. Uh, worst case scenario is you show up 10 minutes early and you hang out there, but you're not the guy that's late. You know, uh, I don't know. Again, I just sound like such an old guy shaking my fist at the sky, but I, <laughs> yeah. it's just my not military upbringing, I think, did it. 
if so, anything, this has just proven that uh, when we do go to the cinema, Lun is definitely going to be late when you meet us. <laughs> no, <laughs> I I believe late. in you. I believe in you. I think that you can do it. Yeah. You know, <laughs> s- you know, little baby steps. You you can get there. You can be on time. You know. <laughs> so um, obviously, you mentioned you're based in Florida as well. You're going to Horror Nights this year. Mm-hmm. Do you yeah. get there every year? Then I, any every year that we are not touring when it's going on. Yeah. 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 Um yeah, I went last year. It was awesome. I just saw this year they announced that they're going to have a a house uh, the weekend has a house, which I think is mm. rad because that dude is like his like aesthetic and his visuals are just yeah. next level, so I'm I'm really looking forward to that. Um yeah, I love Horror Nights, man. It's 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 a high probably the top 3 days of the year uh, always one of them is going to be going to Halloween Horror Nights. I I love it. Yeah. They got Halloween there again this year, aren't they? Yep. Doing a Halloween house. Yeah, I went in 2019 and I went there where they had uh, the Rob Zombie Host of a Thousand Corpses and mm-hmm. they had the Oz, Oz Maze as well. That was my first time experiencing a Horror Nights and yeah, it was brilliant. Yeah, you. It, I think what's uh, what's key is to just try to go on a not peak night, and then also yeah. making sure to get the express pass. That way you can actually see everything and you're not waiting yeah. in line for the entire night. Definitely makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, it's expensive, you know but you know it's it's the only way to go for me. Yeah. See, that's something that uh, we we don't have it over here as much. Um, but you know the the horror houses that you can go to as well. You mm-hmm. know where people decorate their own houses and create their own scare mazes and stuff like that. We don't get that over here. We just get the odd theme park that has a horror night on. Or we have one called Farmageddon, but that's pretty much it. <laughs> where it seems, yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's a lot more celebrated over the uh, in the states than it is over here in the UK, unfortunately. Which is oh, you should make make a trip that, over this year. It's gonna be yeah, it's gonna be fun. Sounds like a perfect reason to go do a podcast somewhere, you know. Uh, I, I I have space, you know. We we can we can just we can just <laughs> do it. In us. Yeah, we can just do it here. I've got the studio. I've got the oh. mics. You know, we'll just yeah, we'll set up. Well, we can all wear a mask during it. It'll be a it'll be like a little yeah. uh, little fun fun thing. <laughs> so here's a question then. So when you're on tour, have you actually visited any like horror locations from like the films and stuff like that? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I went, uh, gosh, let me think as far as horror locations. Um, I went and saw the murder house from the, uh, American horror story season one, uh, yeah, when I was out nice. in LA. Um, let's see. What other horror locations have I seen? Um, the exorcist stairs, uh, in, <laughs> and the house from the exorcist, uh, are oh, right sick. by each other in DC. Uh, that was cool. Um, uh, gosh, there's the, a plaque right in though for where the, um, exorcist stairs are. There's like the plaque to the side of it. Like the camera. Um, I honestly it. don't know if, if there is, I didn't take a picture of it. Um, I don't, I don't remember if there was or not. Um, yeah, but the house is there. You can you can see that pretty good. Uh, the the old Texas Chainsaw Massacre house is a barbecue restaurant, uh, and uh, I got a cha- I got a chance to go there. That was really cool. That's sick. Um, yeah, uh, that's all I can think of off the top of my head. Um, a lot of Jeepers Creepers was filmed not far from from where I live, so I've seen a bunch of those locations. Um, just from just from being that's around. A, that's a new one they've got coming out as well. Jeepers Creepers Reborn. Yeah, I'm. I'm. Do you know anything about that guy, the director of the first one? Yeah. Yes, one I've heard about really, this. Is, yeah. it, is it the same guy directing it then for this new film? I haven't looked properly. I don't know if he's directing it. Yeah, I assume not. Uh, but I also don't know how it works as far as if he is benefiting from, like, if he the still owns the IP. Yeah, yeah, because that I'm not normally that guy where I'm like, I'm like, oh, like boycott whatever. But I just got such a gross taste in my mouth from that guy yeah, that I, yeah. if if he is even somehow benefiting from that movie, I, I probably won't go see it. Um, yeah. I have the same mindset though, yeah. It's a weird one, isn't it? Because uh, like, of all franchises you could pick to 
do another film on. Like, they're not like there's not been like a Nightmare on Elm Street in a while or a Friday the 13th <laughs> or anything yeah. like that. Let's do Jeepers Creepers, where there's a load of uh, baggage to it that no one really wants to mess with. <laughs> yeah, I mean, sometimes the decisions that studios make, they, they baffle me uh, as much as anyone. But, you know, so many times those decisions are... Uh, they're made, you know, you'll, you'll have one guy at a studio that has some power that, you know, loves a particular franchise or can champion something. And that's how it ends up getting made. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I hope that it benefits good people when it comes out. I hope that the people who are working on it are dope. I don't know who's, who's directing it, but you know, there's obviously going to be a lot of people coming together to try to make it happen. And, um, I'm going to check into that. You know, I, I hope that, you know, maybe the, the, the rights, maybe they just uh, reverted back to the studio. Um, and it, you know, it's just a completely, uh, separate thing from the, from the original guy. I'm, I'm hoping, but you know, yeah, I hope mm-hmm. so. Yeah. We shall see if the, if they're still pushing it, I imagine it should be. You know, if they're still going on with the front, but I don't know, man. There's there's times when I see, stuff, isn't there? yeah, <laughs> when I see some people that are still making stuff, I'm like, dang, like they're he's just still <laughs> they're still going for it. Okay, yeah. <laughs> and it's always a he. It's not like oh she's still yeah. You know, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's always a he. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, thanks a lot for coming on. We, yeah, we appreciate that. it. Yeah. Yeah, think of course. It, you know? Yeah, thank you guys for having me. And uh, yeah, maybe we'll uh, yeah do it again at some point. Absolutely. Um, we'll do a fake goodbye now and then, yeah. Perfect. So, uh, thank you so much for taking the time and coming on. Yeah, thank you so much, man. Yeah, yeah, thank you guys. Have a good one. What an episode. That was Chris Dudley of Under Oath <laughs> that we spoke to for an hour and a half. How fucking insane is that? <laughs> it was sick, man. It, it, it was just seeing his, like perspective on like horror and doing the soundtracks and all that sort of thing so it's cool to get that different view on things instead of diving into loads of band stuff jumping on like the horror side of things as well yeah i think that's the first time i've ever got to chat to a composer which has been you know very self-indulgent for myself uh (laughs) thank you boys thank you again to chris for taking the time to chat with us um yeah we loved it uh, if you don't know, this podcast is sponsored by us. We have merch <laughs> at www.anearfulmerchpod... No, anearfulpodmerch.com. It's in the description. Yes, the don't fucking listen to me to put it in your web browser. We have merch. Enjoy. Yeah, yeah and also, don't forget to check out our socials. So, Instagram, Twitter, that we mostly use, Facebook... We had the user, ain't gonna lie, but you can find all that under an earful podcast. Uh, we've got a Discord if you want to join that. Sometimes we're on there. Uh, there's some content on there you can go look at. Um, yeah, mostly we're just talking to ourselves in it at the moment. Um, <laughs> yeah, but head over to the Patreon anyway <laughs> and go check out the merch and also check out the other episodes as well. We're all on Spotify, any other podcast platforms and YouTube if you want to see the video. And we've just been to 2000 Trees Festival, so there's got to be a band there that you uh, that you'd want to listen to. But by the time this is out, it's, you know, six weeks gone. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure they know but it's still, the uh... I'm, I'm sure they know where to listen to the podcast as they're listening to this right now mm-hmm. <laughs> we're fucking idiots thanks for listening guys see you later bye